Thank you, Steve. This paper was published recently in Journal of Forest uh, Policy and Economics. Um, the title is Can Authority Change Through Deliberative Pol Politics? Um, uh, seven authors, all having um, over one decade of um, experience in forest sector of Nepal. Uh, most of them at that time were doing PhD in Australia. Um, so we went together and discussed about this topic of bringing about how we can look at policy, change of policy process, um, policy in Nepal's so-called participatory uh, forest reforms. We uh, came up with the idea of uh, having uh, the historical analysis of that pathway um, by bringing about how uh, different um, actors mobilize the discourses and other resources available to them in a um, political setting uh, where the negotiation of their values, interests, um, and um, um, other resources are there. So they, they, in the process, they try to come um, for the consensus of certain politi policy outcomes. <coughs> So we use uh, this authority, dialectics of authority and deliberative politics. Authority here means uh, the relationship of um, legitimate power. Um, and the deliberative politics involves both the region debate and also the political contestation among different actors. But uh, uh, while doing so, we also think of um, bringing together the in international environmental de development discourses and other resources, and um, including the agencies and uh, funding, and also the local political uh, context, where um, certain political regimes allow certain polit uh, uh, space for uh, deliberative um, deliber uh, deliberation among different actors. So bringing that um, uh, deliberate dial dialectics of authority and deliberative politics, uh, we saw uh, different waves of policy changes. We call them policy waves. And we identified at least six policy waves during uh, 1970s until 2013. Uh, in, that is because uh, in Nepal, we saw the, develop, the uh, development of participatory forestry since 1970s, uh, mid 1970s. So we we thought of bringing, uh, starting our analysis from that. So uh, the first uh, policy wave we call it Himalayan crisis. Uh, it started in 19, mid 1970s. Uh, with the publication of um, the theory of Himalayan de degradation. Yeah. Uh, they call it theory of Himalayan degradation. Uh, Eric Ekholm, he uh, published a book uh, that highlighted that and anticipated that Nepal would go uh, through desertation um, um, by 2000 if the same uh, speed of um, deforestation, soil erosion, and land destabilization continues. So because of that, and also other um, international conferences on mountain 1974, that, was, that also highlighted the same issue. Government reports also had the same thing. So attention of donors at that time was so intense that the um, Department of Forest and the donors joined together to have the massive uh, afforestation projects. So, um, but what they missed at that time was involving local people in the process of making decisions. And when they started planting trees um, that were even exotic trees, uh, not suitable for local livelihoods and something like that, people started resisting it and challenging the authority of uh, the techno bureaucrats and also the development agencies coming from outside. So that uh, dialectics, uh, that, that confrontation and um, crisis, uh, the contestation and resistance from local people uh, was a crisis for the, um, we call it the positivist science, uh, forest science that uh, people cultivated to address the um, 
very complicated environmental problem we had in uh, during that time. So, what happened was because most of the uh, those plantations were failed because local people did not uh, comply with the um, uh, rules they they, they uh, imposed upon them, and also they started grazing in the forest plantation areas, and also some in some places reported that they were uprooting the planted um, trees. So. Mostly, it was um, considered that it, the wave was almost fell. So, realizing that, they started involving local people. Initially, through uh, the local political elected political bodies, but people still didn't comply with that, and that's how the next uh, political wave, we call it participatory wave, um, arose. So, where um, the role and rights of local people uh, was more um, granted more and people were involved in making certain operational decisions for managing forest resources. Um, and they could use the forest and also have, um, manage the forest, uh, make the decision and sell that and also use the, that uh, money for local development activities. So that uh, pulled, uh, this from 1980s, uh, we have that uh, uh, participatory web until now, but it faced a, a, ser a series of crises um, because of uh, the in uh, motivation and intention of uh, techno-bureaucratic authority to retain the power again back to them, um, and also because of the political crisis we had uh, since mid-1990s, we had um, bloody Maoist insurgency and also the takeover of uh, the democratic um, government by the king in early 2000. So that political crisis created a new wave. We call it um, political crisis wave. During that time, many of the rights give earlier granted to local people um, were uh, taken back by the government and uh, feudal authority of the king and techno-bureaucratic authority had the nexus to actually undermine most of the rights given to local people. Subsequently, um, after the overthrow of the king in 2000, after the popular movement, also because of the Maoist insurgency, um, and also because of international discourses and climate change, after Bali conference, we have seen now uh, the carbon uh, wave in Nepal. So carbon, now uh, forests are seen as uh, the carbon sinks. And the product, goods that can be traded, carbon that can be traded to the market, uh, and often compromising the local livelihood concerns of local people. Even in, even in this uh, way, people are um, allowed to debate and raise their concerns in the uh, daily, uh, because the international donors and uh, civil society actors are more prominently active in, in, in this uh, way and they are opening up the space for local people to debate and raise the concern. Despite that, those local, cons uh, local livelihood needs are often compromised in the name of uh, the carbon. So uh, that, is, that, is, that is one scenario. There, is, there are two other waves that, uh, that also exist now. Um, they are to include the conservation wave. During 1970s, when we were going for participatory uh, forestry. Uh, during that time also we had the another uh, development discourse coming up from the West uh, was the conservation, say, um, uh, con preserving the wilderness. That's how um, the then king and the feudal authority um, formed the coalition with the international uh, NGOs and um, techno-bureaucratic authority to um, establish series of protected areas. Those initial were the very exclusionary um, um, employed military to protect the protected areas. Local people were um, denied the access to resources they, they were depend on. That created a very um, significant conflict between park authorities and local people. And they didn't support and uh, poaching was um, uh, undergoing during that phase. So, that challenge and contestation for local, local, local people and also the um, more discourses for participatory development coming from outside 
um, help to create uh, the deliberative space uh, in the conservation area as well. Uh, so we have now uh, more um, participation of uh, local people in buffer, buffer zone areas. We also have some of the participatory conservation areas where local people form the committees and they, they uh, take the most of the responsibilities of conservation. So these, um, they are in a way challenging the traditional techno bureaucratic authority, but still the uh, overall um, power remains with the techno bureaucratic authority since long. Some people even uh, argue that in, they are more powerful than before, but in different um, covert way. Yeah? So um, that is the case. But uh, since 1990s, when we had um, democracy, we also have the very strong inclusion way, where gender and social inclusion within forest sector has, is very strong. And it evolved from more uh, tokenistic participation to now uh, more on leadership and capacity development of women in, in uh, different um, forest governance processes. <clears throat> So, um, so in, in summary, I would say using the approach of unfolding dialectical relationship between authority and deliberative politics, we analyze how pre-existing uh, forms of authority face challenges in and through unfolding deliberative politics in the changing context. And how, how a specific configuration of, of such politics reproduce, re-entrenched, or transform along the way. Uh, we use the, this more historical and part depend, uh, dependent approach for analyzing uh, this policy change in Nepal. Okay. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> thank, thank you, Manning. Okay, thank you. And so, uh, colleagues have the chance to uh, ask questions, uh, offer comments. Aaron, please uh, stand up and give your sure. name uh, in, uh, ans in asking your question. Thanks. I'm Aaron Russell. Thank you for your interesting presentation. Um, I'm interested in the re phase of recentralization when you mentioned that the king and the techno bureaucratic uh, elites re re required a certain amount of the decision making. And I'm curious about how, what shape that took. And um, at, at, at the lo in terms of local forest management, where there had been participatory forest management, what, how, how did the local authorities change in shape, or was it a question of funding to them, or funding allocations, or, and what was the objective stated by the central authorities in recentralizing um, the the approaches? Okay, thank you. Um, there are many, many things happened actually within that very short period of time. It was, um, a takeover was um, about one, one year only from, the, uh, from King, but he started the process a couple of years ago, from since uh, 2002. He started the process, but King took over in 2005, and it uh, remained until 2006, yeah? So during that time, what they did was they suspended uh, many of the rights of local communities and uh, where the, uh, they could make the decision um, to capture the community forest uh, for the purpose of um, settling in this army, deployment of army. Yeah, for, for that was uh, one case. Second was uh, they also made one decision, though it was not um, uh, complied by local communities. They wanted at least 40% of their income to go uh, to government from the community forestry. In Nepal, community, in community forestry, uh, all the um, income uh, from forest products goes to the local, com um, local community themselves, community fund. Um, but if they sell outside, they need to pay certain um, tax yeah, uh, to the government. So, but during that time, they also made that decision. Other decision was also, it was because of Maui's insurgency also, they obstructed the uh, export of timber from one community to other communities or one district to another district. So limiting in many places because most of the communities also were dependent on 
um, the fund coming from uh, the revenue coming from forests. Many were funding the um, salary for teachers, and many were also um, covering the other costs of community development. So they had they had to compromise that cost because um, because of them, that ban, they couldn't sell outside. Um, also, um, they were not allowed to um, gather and assemble, assemb uh, organize assemblies. Very restricted. Um, they had to get the permission from different. Um, security agencies and also from the Maoists uh, during that time. So uh, that democratic process was also very compromised at local level. So, so, so many, so many things. And also the civil society actors uh, were also not allowed to um, organize uh, protests or something like that against uh, any move of the king during that time. Yeah. Uh, Christopher. Hi, I'm Christopher Matthews. I'm uh, working in C4 on, on forest and climate change. Uh, so my question is, uh, you mentioned, uh, so what you described is, is, a, is, a, is a series of discourses that shape the policy processes in, in Nepal. And, and, uh, and some uh, apparently were driven by processes in the country and some were driven by, country, by processes outside, outside or inter, uh, on an international basis like the maybe the participation or the conservation debate, I don't know. But some of these are obviously driven by, by force outside the country. And in the global comparative study on RED, which we are undertaking, uh, we see that that similar processes. In some countries, uh, the RED debate, RED plus debate is being brought into the country and strongly carried by, by foreign forces, like foreign NGOs and so on, international NGOs, and in other countries, it's driven by national ownership, and we see that only when national ownership is there, actually the the process moves forward. Did you did you see anything similar in in, in this uh, regard? Yeah, in Nepal, both uh, in in terms of uh, expanding deliberative space uh, for different actors, Red um, has certainly done very good job. But in terms of setting priorities and getting gaining the ownership of local people and other actors. It's hard to say because uh, they are mostly top down. The, it, they came from outside through international donor support and also knowledge coming from outside about um, this verification, monitoring, uh, more technical expertise, they are requiring technical expertise in uh, moving it forward. So um, some, somehow the people, uh, we feel that people are left behind and more the experts and uh, techno bureaucrats and the international communities are taking the driving seat in all, all processes. So, but the locally, if you see, the, because um, it has uh, given more authority to techno bureaucratic system, uh, because uh, government system, government is in the central stage uh, in all those um, uh, processes, uh, and, and also the support comes through that. So, um, it is hard to say. In some, some way, it is more uh, opening up spaces. In other ways, uh, it's compromising some uh, local values, wisdom, and um, needs. So that is, that is uh, yeah. Lou? Yeah, Lou Versho. Just picking up on that, the international community, as it, it's put in place the, internet, the, the red mechanism, is requiring countries to actually put in place some safeguards to make yeah. sure that, that, that local rights are protected. And all that. Is, is some of this actually percolating into that system, and do you think that that's going to help improve the situation, that, that this international requirement for, for financial support puts in place these, these safeguards, and, and, and is Nepal going to be responsive to that? Um, yes, I think that's why um, the civil society actors are also more leaning towards it, because there are spaces where they can raise their voice, clear the safeguards against uh, any potential threats of local livelihoods or local uh, right curtailing. So, but I'm not really exactly sure how it is operationalizing now. Uh, but during that time, it was at the uh, at the national level. Most of the processes were at national level and uh, penetrating to the sub-national level, not reaching ultimately to the uh, community level because uh, the processes uh, was still in early stages. Um, by now, I don't know exactly about that. Um, I can't say anything about that, but um, when we were reviewing for this paper, 
um, there were um, national processes, RPP was uh, in place, um, the red cell was is, uh, established within the Ministry of Forestry. Um, different actors were involved in seeking funds to do some, some of the uh, awareness raising activities or something like that, doing some research around um, that aspect, but not penetrating until the community level. Eh? Uh, some uh, multi-stakeholder processes at district uh, level, I, 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 we could see at that time. Uh, and reflection on that was that uh, people feel a little bit hurt. That's why uh, the, um, they could raise the issues, and those issues were brought into the processes at national level. Um, but exactly not sure how communities um, responded about that. Christine. Thank you. Again, um, as Steve said, Christine Paddock, um, as Steve said, the Nepal case is always, or the, the history of these changes in Nepal is so well known, but I, I swear I'm completely ignorant. So let me ask you a question about the participatory phase, which in your history sounds like the best one, especially for local people. But there's been a lot of criticism of what participation actually, what forms it really took in communities, and how again it was often sort of framed in in ways that were really quite outside the uh, particular communities, and participation was to be done in very standardized sort of ways. Could you just comment on that, of how, what it looked like in Nepal? Yeah, it's, it's, uh, if I see Indonesia or other countries, it is very much advanced. Yeah. I, I, would, I, I agree with that. Um, but uh, because certain things are historic, historically influenced, social structures, gender relationships, uh, those aspects are, uh, require a multitude of pressures and forces operating together to, to make change happen in one setting. Uh, in terms of uh, forest policy and uh, the governance, uh, that has been taken as the, an, um, a lesson from, from I, 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 um, I can check from here, three diamonds, uh, three phases of this inclusion um, with her. Initially, because women were not uh, even involved in the decision-making forums, uh, then at that time, main interest and main enthusiasm of donors and other actors was to bringing in uh, to the committees and uh, those uh, spheres of decision-making. So the, the, our attention was to, have the numbers in the committees, yeah? one third, at least one third women should be there in the committees, something like that. But even if that was the case, we later found that uh, women were not attending the meetings. What is the meaning of keeping them in the list? Uh, just tokenist thing. Yeah? So we, uh, then the focus shifted to us uh, how we can make them attend the meetings. <laughs> what are the barriers to attend the meetings? That discourse created that uh, um, monitoring and evaluation of those part of community forestry system should also involve how many people and who attended the meetings, not only how many in the committees. So that shifted from, at, um, from only representation to uh, attending the meeting. Later we found that even if they were sitting in the meeting, even if out of 10, uh, out of 11, only uh, all the 10 women were there and only single uh, man was at, uh, there, men influence all the decisions. So then the, uh, the focus shifted on how we can actually bring in the voice of those um, communities and how women's leadership and influence can be ensured. That is how the discourse is shaping and now uh, our uh, this gender and social inclusion strategy within Ministry of Forestry and uh, Community Forestry guidelines, recent guidelines, also has emphasized that leadership and influence of women and other marginalized groups in community forestry governance. So uh, the shift is there, and we can see if you compare from 1990s and now, you see the tremendous um, change happening in terms of uh, women's agency uh, in forest governance. Um, but um, it's still not equal, or not equitable, uh, uh, it's not at, um, equitable. If they, uh, but the progress, has been made significantly. But there are, um, you can criticize that it's still not sufficient. So. Christine, a follow-up question? 
Yeah. Uh, you've, you've talked about gender. Any other um, any other measures of inclusion, um, not gender based? I mean, gender sometimes maybe. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. Maybe uh, emphasized. Yeah, there is another two two others uh, we can think of. One is the ethnic, because our our society is ethnically very diverse, and also this caste system we have. Normally, we we see that in most of the public spheres are captured by high caste or some 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 ethnic groups and marginalized, excluded others, uh, and also the class. Uh, poor people can't afford to come because most of the community forest uh, systems and meetings and all leadership positions, they're all voluntary. So you need to be ready to um, provide your voluntary time for co collective action. <clears throat> so poor people can't afford that. So that's why they are not participating. And debate is there how we can ensure to compensate their time if they, uh, they attend those meetings. <clears throat> that is also part of that. And many community forest groups have started uh, to develop some policies of um, involving them, how, how could they come? So this ethnic and class dimension is also there. Recently, um, because uh, uh, this distant users, concept of distant user is also there, the community forestry in Nepal so far has been focused to the people living around or in the forest. But many people sometimes are dependent on forest products, for certain forest products. Some come for timber only, from maybe five, six, ten kilometers away. Some come for certain uh, NTFEs. But by community forestry, delineating the boundary of users and boundary of the forest, we often overlooked uh, those distant users. And the people who really need fuel wood. They are not nearby forest, but they depend on fuel wood. They are using cow dung. To, to for as energy source. The debate is how we can, um, the community forestry system can help those people live, living very far from the forest, but still they need some fuel wood or timber for their uh, subsistence need. So that is, uh, that debate uh, surfaced into another form of participatory, so-called participatory uh, system. They call it collaborative forestry where they involve potential users from north and south maybe some, some even 20 kilometers far from the forest. They, they can't come to the forest for, for management, but uh, they, they see that they are legitimate users because they don't have other sources. So um, there are some modalities going on to experiment how we can accommodate those excluded um, people in the system. Great, good, thank you, Manny. Well, this has been very interesting, uh, and you've, I think, very convincingly demonstrated just how complicated and, and long-term processes of, of forest governance change will be, or, or if they're going to you know, make progress. It's not simply a matter, uh, as is often the case, of having new policies, new laws empowering communities, actually you know, creating the context, uh, the capabilities within which uh, communities can effectively exercise those rights in fair and equitable ways is another question altogether. And that really is sort of the long road uh, to forest reform that you've described here. So we're, we're very grateful to you uh, for that. Thank you, Manny. Okay, thank, thank you very much. Thank you.